Creator God, my thoughts from my heart and the glory speak from my mouth be acceptable to you and enlighten me to be in this your people. Amen. Irish tradition credits St. Patrick with driving all of the snakes of Ireland. He may have, but since the snakes are not native to Ireland, there weren't many for him to drive out. Sharon and I have our own snake story. She encountered a rather large black snake sunning itself near our air conditioning unit when we lived in this tent in Virginia. Her response was a loud cry of help to one of our neighbors who she was sure would know how to deal with this threat. Dante reassured both of us that the snake, though it was big, probably several feet long, was harmless. And Sharon was relieved when the snake slithered away across the street. So what's all this business about snakes and serpents? Our Old Testament reading is a serpent encounter for the Israelite people. They had been nomads in the desert for almost an entire generation, more than 40 years. Late in the journey, they encounter poisonous serpents whose bite surely means death. Most people don't like any creature that poses a threat to their lives, so the Israelites' fear is understandable given their circumstances. Even in the 21st century, most people don't like serpents or snakes that can harm them. In the New Revised Standard Version translation of the Bible, the word serpent or serpents occurs 35 times. They are first introduced in Genesis as a more crafty than any other animal type creature who tempts Eve to eat the forbidden fruit. So serpents get their bad reputation early on in the scripture. In Genesis, serpents are mentioned five times, all of them in the early chapters, and they are without being without any indication that they are poisonous. In our in this story, the Hebrew name for the serpents is Nahas, which is understood as a mythical creature of chaos opposed to God. Now, in Numbers, the serp serpents there are threatening the Israelites, and they are identified as poisonous serpents. The Hebrew word for them is serap, or fiery seraphim, venomous creatures that crawl or slither on the ground. So the Israelites have been given victory over King Arad of the Canaanites. The Lord helped them to gain this victory, and regardless of that, they complain about the manna, which is called cursed bread, and the lack of other food and water on their journey. It is the first time the people address the Lord directly with their complaints. You see the you in verse 5 is plural, so they at least have learned that Moses and the Lord are in this journey together. Perhaps the victory they just saw gained by seeking the Lord may have finally impressed upon them that the Lord works through Moses. Immediately, the fiery serpents kill many, and the survivors admit their sin by complaining against the Lord and against Moses. The Lord's solution after Moses prays for the people is to instruct him to make a bronze serpent and place the figure on a pole. 
The bronze serpent, serpent saves many people who have been bitten by the fiery serpents from whom death is almost inevitable. This bronze serpent on the pole will appear again in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 4, where it is referred to as Nahashtim. Moses' bronze serpent has now become an idol, and the people are worshiping him and sacrificing to it in violation of God's law. King Hezekiah, the ruler of Judah, shatters the idol to correct the people's misguided religions. Oops, I forgot that picture. In our gospel reading this morning, Jesus is referring to Moses' bronze serpent on the pole in verse 14. John has Jesus referenced in this story, referencing this story from Numbers as a way of explaining that he, Jesus, is up to something important here. It is the first reference to being lifted up and goes back to the story with snakes and poisonous and poison and grumbling people. Why did it have to do with snakes? What's so uplifting about a story with a snake on a stick? That sounds like a question that Nicodemus would ask. John 3, 14, 21 are Jesus' words for Nicodemus at the end of his secret encounter with Jesus. But let's back up a little bit to the beginning of chapter 3 to understand what Jesus is talking about. Why did Jesus make reference to a serpent in the desert before uttering those famous verses the most famous verses in the whole New Testament, found in John 3.16. You see, Nicodemus was a leader of the people of God. He was a Pharisee and a member of the same Hebrew, the governing body of the Jews in Israel at Jesus' time. He comes at night, maybe because serious study takes place at night, or maybe because he was afraid of being associated with this questionable rabbi from the backwoods of Galilee. He comes with social niceties, a bit of flattery to grease the wheels of their conversation. But Jesus immediately changes the subject. He puts him on the defensive. You have to be a different person to be a part of what God has in store. Nicodemus is really almost immediately knocked off his feet, his feet. He spends the rest of the conversation trying to catch up with Jesus. He makes a feeble joke about climbing back into his mother's womb, hoping to disarm the intensity of the teacher. Because being a different person is defined in a metaphor about new birth. Born again, he said. Born from above, he thought. The word in Greek means both things, a reference to time and to direction. Born again. Born of the Spirit from above. That concept has poor Nicodemus at his wit's end. He has no capacity to understand and he's unwilling to be transformed in such a fashion. Born again was invisible, but love and hope and joy and transformation and possibility. Quite different from being born from below. Being born from below for Nicodemus was not a bad life. Just a shallow one. Just a nose to the grindstone and find your meaning in successes and failures each and every day. It's not like being born from above in the love of a creator who stands ready to fill you with vision. Jesus gave Nicodemus a whole lot of stuff to think about. We don't know how it affected him 
Well, what he went away with that night. But a few chapters later, when the rest of the Jewish leadership is complaining that the police didn't arrest Jesus for speaking of his of the kingdom of God, Nicholas speaks up and says, Don't we have due process? Isn't there a way we're supposed to deal with this guy? Now, this is not an affirmation of faith for sure by any means, but at least he attempts to stand on the right side. They sneered at him, accused him of being a hidden from the sticks, just like Jesus. Then Nicodemus shrinks from sight, completely. Not completely. He doesn't speak again. He shows up in the darkness. Later, in the afternoon of the darkness of the weeping world, and gathers up the body from a horrible death, and wraps it up with about a hundred pounds of spices, and puts it in the tomb of another Pharisee named Joseph. A hundred pounds of spices may have been a bit of overkill. Maybe it was an apology spice. Maybe Nicodemus figured out what he'd been missing since that night in the darkness and wanted to make up for it by bringing so much that he could barely carry it. The penance of spice poured out over a dead body that was not going to stay dead. Though Nicodemus didn't know that yet. Nicodemus' story is not about having the courage or the faith or the desperate need to look up and live. As well, the story in one verse is not about a snake, and it isn't about worshiping an idol, an odd sort of idol. It's about looking up and acknowledging that people need help. It isn't hard to imagine the squeamishness of these Hebrew people to have a bronze snake on a pole in the midst of their camp while they are surrounded by snakes nipping at their knees. We can be sure that their prayer was that God would move the snakes out of the way and give them a clear path on their journey. But God chose differently. He left the snakes around them left them vulnerable to the poison that could kill them. Yet he gave them a remedy, a solution to the danger that surrounded them. And all they needed to do was look up and live. Sometimes we need snakes. There's a story about three men who live on a ranch out west. The father John and his sons Jake and Joe. They never had any use for church until one day Jake is bitten by a rattlesnake. The doctor is summoned, but the prognosis is not good. Jake is going to die. The, doc uh, the younger son is sent to bring the preacher. When he arrives, the parson is asked to offer a prayer for Jake. The prayer went like this. O oh, Father God, we give you thanks that you have sent this snake to bite Jake. It has brought him to seek you. We ask, Lord, that you should send another snake to bite Joe, and a really big one, to bite the old man. So they too might come to seek you. We thank you for your providence and ask that you send among us bigger and better rattlesnakes. Amen. Jake and John and Joe needed a snake. They needed somehow to, to look up and see what was around them. It's not a difficult thing to look up at a snake on a stick or a man dying on a cross, and yet it is the hardest thing we could ever do as independent thinking human beings. It's about surrendering ourselves to that which will save us, rather than thinking that we can do it ourselves 
if we just plug away at it long enough. It's admitting that there is poison in our system that will kill us if we don't do something radical, something desperate. The ultimate purpose of Jesus' coming is to be lifted up as a source of healing and life. Like the serpent in the wilderness, lifted up has two senses, lifted up on the cross and exalted. To be born again from above means receiving life of the Spirit to the life-giving death of Jesus Christ. We, like Nicodemus and the Israelites and the three cowboys, need a Savior. And it's about obedience to the one who will rescue us from what is killing us. If we just look up and live. Jesus is lifted up on the cross as the light of the world to give us a path to the right relationship with God. Look up and see Jesus, the light of the world, with the solution for the ageless problem of sin and separation from God. Don't look down at the ground where the poison snakes are with other perfect things that sleep with. <coughs> look up and look at the light of God's love, now removed from the crown, from the cross, and resurrected with this heavenly fire. The light of God's love came to this world to save you and to save me.